turn our hearts to the sermon today, the topic is Pass It On. And in recognition of um, the transitions that we are going through today, I felt that we will talk about what is it that we are passing it on. We we'll look at the subtopic, effective leadership transitions. Pass it on, effective leadership transitions. Um, as I prepared and I thought about this, I got interested to look at some of the longest serving uh, leaders or presidents in Africa. And at number one is Theodoro, Theodoro Obiang Mwema Basogo, the president of Guinea. He has been the president since 1979. <laughs> so he has been president for 41 years plus. I'll be making some comments later on. At number two is Paul Biel of Cameroon. He became president in 1982 to date. So just shy of um, 40 years going. You have Jose Eduardo dos Santos of Angola, 1979. He handed over, but he served until 2017. Uh, so many, many years. Denise Sosongueso of Congo. Still going strong. He served in 1979 to 92, took a short break, and then came back. <laughs> came back in 1997, and he's still going strong to date. Of course, we know uh, Robert Mugabe, the former president of Zimbabwe, served from 1987 until he, he, he was, you know, hosted. It's on and on, we can go Idris W. Church, 1990 to 2021, going strong. Asia Safweki of Eritrea, some of these you may not know them, from 1991 and still going strong. And on and on, we don't have the time. Why am I highlighting this? That I think leadership transition or succession, <coughs> excuse me, has remained a major challenge not only in Christian circles but even in society at large. The phrase, and I quote, he or she has left a shoe too large for anyone to fit. I'm sure you have heard it. End of quote. Illustrates this challenge. On the one hand, we have hurried leadership transitions which leave huge gaps for continuity. Whether it's through a coup or people are chased away uh, or whatever it is, you find some gaps in leadership transitions. While on the other hand, we have leaders, as I've mentioned some of them, overstaying and never giving space for emerging leaders. And this is not just on this list of presidents. Some bishops, I won't name them necessarily, have been bishops from, if you come from the part where I come from, from 19 part of book. You know, what that means, some of you may not know that Greek, but it just simply means from, how do you translate it? You can't translate it from forever. They have remained bishops. And they are not leaving space for others to emerge and develop. I think this topic is especially pregnant today as we usher in new leaders in the Christian Union and spent time in the AGM in the afternoon uh, to review the past one year and plan for the, next, the year ahead. We therefore turn to the Bible as our rule of faith for viable lessons to address this huge challenge and pray that the lessons gleaned through this sermon this morning will not only be useful for the new CU leaders that will be ushered in this afternoon, but to all of us who will at one time or another be facing or handling leadership transition. Let us pray. Again, we pray that you may speak to us. Speak to us, your servant, listens. Open the eyes of our hearts that we may see you and hear from you. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll be looking at some biblical, one particular biblical example of an effective leadership transition. And from there, we'll then be looking at some principles that we can glean, not only for this transition that we are seeing in the Christian Union, but I think we need to think about this even as we face next year, 
uh, when as a country we'll be having our next general elections. Young people like most of you here are the ones that are normally used by politicians either to cause havoc or to bring in compoops, if you know that word, bring people who have no qualification whatsoever to become our leader. And a society cannot rise above its leadership, however hard it tries. Whether you wake up at 4 a.m. or 2 a.m. to work so hard, the leaders, especially our political leaders, have a very significant impact in the quality and nature of life that we have as a society. And so I want to beseech you as you listen to this, let it not just be for this uh, AGM that you'll be having today, but let it be a time of reflection that as we think of next year and we look at some of the leadership transitions that we'll be thinking through or voting, we can try to ask ourselves whether we can see uh, some of the principles that we'll be talking about. One of the classic examples of an effective leadership transition is a transition from Moses to Joshua. A very familiar story, but it spans several books, and sometimes we do not have the time or do not spend sufficient time to combine or to join the dots from all the different books, all the way from Exodus to the book of Joshua and Judges. And so allow me, and I hope you can be patient as we go through scripture to look at this leadership transition, Moses to Joshua. Of course, before I mention, before I delve deeper into that, there are several examples in the Bible, both good and bad leadership transitions. Bad transitions, one of them, a classic one, is from Saul to David. Saul as a king really never quite hands over to David. At some point he is actually chasing away and wants to kill David. And we don't see that harmonious handing over of power and leadership. That kind of transition, if you read scriptures, from Saul to David. We don't have time to look at that. From Solomon to Rehoboam is another transition that is not particularly encouraging. In fact, Solomon, David hands over to his son Solomon, again a very troublesome uh, transition if, if you were to look at it from scripture. But David celebrates Solomon, prays for Solomon, and you see some semblance of a mature leader, so David as a father, handing over to Solomon. But when Solomon's time comes, despite all that was given, despite all the wisdom, if you read through the Bible, he was a man of immense wisdom and given so much uh, resources. When time comes to hand over the leadership of Israel, he hands over to his son Rehoboam, but actually, at that point, the kingdom splits into two. Because a majority of the tribes of Israel, ten of them refused to recognize Rehoboam as their king and instead installed Jeroboam as their king. And that's a very interesting, uh, again, transition to watch. But again, in the interest of time, we don't have time to look at that. Good examples, of course, we've talked about Moses to Joshua, David to Solomon, Jesus to the twelve disciples, Paul to Timothy, and etc. So let's focus a little bit more on Moses to Joshua, there, that Mo Moses to Joshua leadership transition. The first mention of Joshua is in Exodus chapter 17, verse 8 to 16. We just note it. You'll get these notes after this, so you can choose whether to write or to listen. At that point in Exodus chapter 17, he is selected by Moses to lead the army of Israel to go fight against the Amalekites, which seems to indicate that by then, Moses has significant confidence in Joshua. It is that passage of story where Moses sits somewhere and is raising up his hands as the war is going on. And we read that whenever his hands went down, the Amalekites were overcoming the Israelites until they decided to put up stones to hold his hands together. In other words, it was a very long battle. It was not a quick fix battle. But Moses, as the leader, had the confidence to choose young Joshua to be the army commander. 
to be the one leading that operation. Seems to indicate that from that initial first introduction of Joshua, he was a man to be watched. Exodus chapter 24 is the next passage we look at Joshua. Because we ask ourselves, who is this Joshua? Why do we seem to see such a seamless transition of leadership and power from Moses to Joshua? We have to then go back and understand about Joshua because he is not presented as much as Moses is presented to us. Moses, we know his story right from when he was a baby and all that. Exodus chapter 24 verse 3, Joshua accompanies Moses up the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. That is very insightful. That for the 40 nights and 40 days that Moses is up the mountain, and again I go back to what I'm saying, my latest uh, uh, hobby, as I would call it, of mountain climbing. You go up to Point Lenana and you're above the clouds and you're looking up, down, and there's some sense of awesomeness, of wonder. And in almost literally, there's a sense of closeness to God. I won't delve into that. That's a side topic. But Moses was not alone up the mountain transacting business like some of our leaders, whether political or church leaders, who secretly go do their business without anybody knowing. Even their wives have no idea what they're doing. Moses, in this sacred moment when he is receiving the Ten Commandments from God, who does he choose to accompany him? Joshua. We read again about Joshua in, 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 in Exodus chapter 32. As they come down, Exodus chapter 32 is a very sad chapter because they have spent in 24 and all that, they have spent time, Moses has spent time up the mountain receiving the tablets from God, the commandments. And as they come down, they hear some singing and noise from the camp, from down. And Joshua is the one, he's with Moses, he's the one who tells Moses, I can hear some voices, I can hear. It's like the sound of war or whatever, of celebration, it's very unclear. So again you find Joshua is with Moses. At that point when Moses gets the two tablets in anger, and so Joshua has this opportunity to observe this man of God in his best moments when he's receiving the, the, the commandments from God, but also in a sense in his worst moments when he's so livid, he's so annoyed, he's so enraged. We'll be coming back to that later on. Exodus chapter 33. He not only accompanied Moses in up the mountain, but the Bible says that Joshua guarded the tent of meeting as Moses was inside meeting face to face with God. And the Bible makes it, that particular passage makes it very curious that while Moses went in and out talking to God, Joshua never left the tent. He spent time with God. And we'll be talking about the spirituality of a leader as a very critical aspect of being founded and established and having their identity in God in such a way that they are able uh, to, to, sorry, they are able to interpret and understand and withstand all the things that um, they are going through at whatever time. So he spent time, he guarded, and not just guarded, but he spent time in the tent of meeting. Numbers, we move on to numbers. That's what I'm saying. The story of Joshua is, is covering several books. The book of Numbers chapter 11, Joshua was present when the Lord sent his spirit among the 70 leaders. He was with Moses at that point, and he was the one who addressed some of the excesses in that particular passage. We don't have time to. Two of the leaders who are prophesying against the way that Moses had instructed, and Joshua was the one who came in to correct that situation and ensure that all the respect that Moses needed to, to get was given. Numbers chapter 13, 
the passage we are more familiar, maybe we are more familiar with, is that Joshua was the one was one of the twelve chosen as the twelve spies. And sometimes in our reading of the Bible, maybe we think that that came very that came fast. No, chronologically, as you look at the Bible, it came much later on. And so his being chosen as a spy to go and spy the land was not accidental. Was not favoritism. He had proved himself right from war, from being with Moses, from being his aid and walking with Moses through thick and thin and as it were. And he was one of those, only he and Caleb were the ones who had faith to come back and say, yes, there are giants, the land is, is great, we can go, let us believe in God. Him, only him and Joshua. And later on you read scripture, it is only Joshua and Caleb of that generation whom the Lord allowed to go into the promised land. It is, I don't know whether we, we appreciate the depth of that statement. That out of a whole generation, let's say if you were to talk of a generation, if you were to say most of, our, most of you here are of the same similar age, that out of this whole hall, only two people were finally allowed to live long enough and to transition to see the God's promised land. Even Moses himself did not go in. And so Joshua stands out as a, a very significant um, Continuity. He held the history before and after. Numbers chapter 27, again quickly, uh, chapter 27, verse 18 to 23. A very significant passage that I'd like us now to read. Numbers 27, verse 18 to 23. Joshua is ordained into leadership by Moses. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is a spirit of leadership. That is critical. A man in whom there is the spirit of leadership. And we've seen the qualities of a leader that he had, right from being, leading in war and leading in different circumstances and lay hands on him, verse 19, have him stand before Elias and the priest and the entire assembly and commission him in their presence. Again, I want to just pause there and say the, the encouragement that has been extended, that the members be there when the new leadership will be taking over, is not just a ceremonial event. There's a spiritual significance when leaders are commissioned in the presence of those that they lead. Verse 20, give him some of your authority. We'll revisit that statement. Some of your authority. So the whole Israel community will obey him. He is to stand before Elias the, the, the priest who will obtain decisions for him by inquiring from of the Urim before the Lord. At his command, he and the entire community of the Israelites will go out, and at his command, they will come in. Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua and had him, and, and had him stand before Eleazar the priest and the whole assembly. Then he laid his hands on him and commissioned him as the Lord had instructed Moses. That was before Moses died. We have two commission, commissionings of Joshua. We have this one and the one that we spent most of our time looking at it closely. This commissioning and seizing of some authority, Moses is still there. And Moses was such a powerful leader that you could easily say, he shoes who can fit in, nobody can fit in. But God instructs Moses to start that transition before he dies. You don't have to wait until you die or you're not there in order to hand over power and authority. And we'll come, we'll be so, so angry that it becomes our main passage and main focus of this sharing this morning. 
Joshua is reordained, is recommissioned into leadership after the death of Moses. In the book of Joshua, it starts right from chapter 1, verse 1. And I'm going to read it and highlight a couple of things as we have a deep analysis of this passage of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 1 to 18. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, by the way, let me just pause a little bit before we read there. From Numbers chapter 27, there is a whole, it seems like there is a gap. But the, because there are a lot of other things which went on until the death of Moses, recorded in later on. So at the point when Joshua was anointed or ordained into leadership in Numbers chapter 27, Moses is still alive. And so you sort of have this mental and this co-leadership that we'll be talking about later on taking place. But Moses finally dies and exits the stage, not after 42 years like the presidents we've talked about, some of them. But you know, Moses, verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. God is, the Lord said to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then you and all these people Get ready to cross the river Jordan, or Jordan River, into the land I'm about to give to them, the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, so as I, as I promised Moses. Verse 4, your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the heated, heated country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. That's a very powerful promise God is giving Joshua. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. The phrasing there is very similar to the book of John chapter 20, verse 20. As the Spirit, as the Father has sent me, so send I you, or so I sent you. The sense that God's presence will be with, with Joshua just as he was with Moses. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. He repeats that. Verse 7. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Verse 9. Have I not commanded you? It's like this is the third time he's repeating the same thing. The first time, be strong and courageous. Verse 7. Sorry, verse 6, be strong and courageous. Verse 7, be strong and courageous. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own or for your inheritance, according to other versions. Verse 12. But to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember, verse 13, the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you after he said, The Lord your God will give you rest by giving you this land. Your wives, your children and your livestock may stay in the land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan. But all your fighting men, all the Morans, all your fighting men must cross over, or rather ready for battle, must cross over ahead of your fellow Israelites, not behind them. You are to help them until the Lord gives them rest as he has done to you. And until they do, they too have taken possession of the land, of the land the Lord your God is giving them. After that, you may go back and occupy your own land with which Moses, the servant of the Lord, 
gave you east of the Jordan toward the sunrise. Then they answered Joshua, whatever you have commanded us, we will do. Whatever you have commanded us, we will do. And whatever, wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey it, and what, whatever you may command them, will be do, done what? Put to death. Only be strong and courageous. The fifth time that command is being repeated in that passage. Be strong and courageous. So let's look deeper in the Bible. Forgive me if this sounds a bit boring, but I find that the Word of God brings life and gives life. And I get very upset when we go for a service and we do everything else except spend time in God's Word. So let's be patient and look at this, these 18 verses. Verse 1 I just want to go step by step, not all the verses, but verse 1, we see there's a continuity from the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy ends with the exit of Moses. The book of Joshua starts with the entry of who? Joshua. There's a continuity. Joshua is installed by God as the leader, but there's the reference that Joshua who was, is described as what? The son of Nun, Moses' aid. Verse 2, Joshua is to lead Israel across River Jordan. Again, if you're a key student of the Bible, something is striking because Moses also led the Israelites across a certain water body. Which one? The Red Sea. And so Moses leads or led the Israelites across the Red Sea and Joshua is charged to lead the Israelites across River Jordan. Verse 2, where is he leading them to? Not in the political slogan of Canaan, but to the promised land. You know. A fulfillment of the promise which was not just given to Moses, but it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. God promises Abraham the boundaries that are described in this passage. You find them, you find their origin in God's promise in the book of Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. And if I if, if were to spend a little bit of time and look at Joshua, he is... On his shoulders is placed the fulfillment of such a huge promise that for, for hundreds of years the children of Israel have, have looked forward to, to be in their land, the land promised by God. I would imagine the, the weight of responsibility that was on Joshua's shoulder. And I, I wouldn't be shocked if at times he looked at, around and said, I wish Moses was, was alive. As a new leader, there are times when you look back and you say, you wish the other leaders were, were there. You wish the old exec would actually sometimes come back and hold forth a little bit. But they are all, they have exited the scene. And I think that's why three, four, four, whatever times, God had to keep on repeating, be what? Be strong and courageous. Verse 3 and 4 is a very clear demarcation of the land. We won't spend too much time there, but it is very, very clear what was the specific remit or the expanse of that land. Verse 5, God reassures and you know reassures Joshua of his abiding presence, just as he was with Moses. And the same words that are used here are almost identically used for Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verse 24. Where God promises Moses that I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. In fact, it seems like this particular verse is a direct quote, quote from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 24. Verse 6 
7 and verse 9 is that repetition and eventually also verse 18. So there are four repetitions. Be strong and courageous. We see the same thing repeated to Moses in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 7 and verse 23. When Moses was commissioning Joshua and saying be strong. Verse 7 is a new thing introduced here. We'll revisit later on. Obey all the law. Do not depart from the law to the left, I mean to the right or to the left. Obedience to the law. Again, echoing the words of Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 14. If you obey, if you follow all these commands, then shall you have these following blessings. Verse 8, obedience is a condition for being prosperous and successful. And allow me to take a swipe here very briefly and digress and say that anybody preaching prosperity and success without obedience to God's word is a, an apostate, is a false prophet. God's word through and through reiterates that success Prosperity is hinged and based on obedience to God's word. You cannot divorce the two. And that's why in verse 8, God instructs Joshua very specifically. Obey, do not depart from this to the right or to the left. And so I get very, very, very surprised when I, I, I read or I see some of our leaders, some of our prophets or whatever you call them, saying they do not have time for the word of God. I won't mention names, but we have people who preach everything else except, except the word of God. Be very careful. Because God says, let these words, meditate on these words when? Day and night. Let these words not escape from your lips. Recite them. It is a tragedy in our generation, and more so in your generation. Scripture memory is becoming a challenge, is threatened. Because of these gadgets we call them, the mobile phones. We think we can always go back there. What happens, what will happen when you get to a situation where you cannot access your mobile phone, or the, or the Bible in your mobile phone? Your word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. How do we continue to ensure, like God is instructing you, Joshua, to meditate on God's word and to ensure that it becomes our true norm. We do not deviate from it, neither to the right nor to the left. Verses 13 and to 15 is a specific command to the two and a half tribes of Israel. The two and a half tribes. Why is that specific and very important? They had already been allocated the land the other side of Jordan. They did not have to cross Jordan. Hallelujah. And I think in them, at the back of their mind, they're just saying, hallelujah. We don't have to go fight the, the, the Hittites and all those Jebusites and whatever. Our deal is done and dusted. Let the others go. But Joshua is first instruction to the people, after being ordained of God, and commissioned of God, is to remind these people that they had already been instructed by Moses when Moses was alive that they are to go and support their brothers, the, ten, the, 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 the nine and a half tribes who had to cross Jordan. And it is very insightful, again, scripture reading, inductive Bible study, looking at that particular passage, they were to lead from the front, not from behind. They were not just escorting the people, no, they were actually to lead the assault and the, the, the taking off of, of, the, of Canaan from the front. Verse 16 to 18, the people's response and pledge of allegiance to Joshua. An affirmation that indeed this transition has gone well. One of the marks of a good transition is that the people being led recognize and commit and pledge their allegiance, their commitment to obey and to follow the new leader. Woe unto you when you take over leadership in a fractured society where half of them are going to Canaan or are not yet in Canaan and half of them are having the year of Jubilee. Maybe politically you don't understand that. 
but it is a difficult leadership situation when you are being entrusted to a people where my, a good portion of them cannot be able to say the words that these people, verse 16, that then they, who are they? The people answered Joshua, whatever you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. I wish, or rather I would say, that, that would be, the, that's a dream of every leader, every new leader, that they'll have people who are willing to die for them. These are the kind of leaders like the 30 valiant men of David, where David at one point is so thirsty and he just says, oh, that I may have water from the well of and the people are so and are so sold out to him that what do they do? They break rank, they risk their lives, they go and get that water, and they bring it back to David, and David pours it out as an offering. He says, I cannot drink this water because it is your, your blood. I pray that as we go into elections in the coming year, that we may get a leader. God may help us. Over the last several elections, we have had a very fractious, a very fractured election process. I don't know whether I'm being prophetic. I'm not a prophet, neither am I the son of a prophet. But one of the things, if you could pray to God, that God may give us a leader that we as, a, as one people may acknowledge that leader or those leaders and go behind them. We got there in 2003 but quickly lost that goodwill for whatever reason. It's a great privilege for a new leadership when some of us, I don't know how many of you are to Urupak at the inauguration of Kibaki, and we sang our voices hoarse, Yote Yawezekana Bila Nani, Bila Moi, and we looked like baboons because we sat, you know, Urupak has no seat. And it had rained that night, maybe as a sign of God's blessing. My wife and I, my wife was pregnant, I think, seven months, very heavy. People were wondering, what's wrong with you? We made our way right into that place, that crazy place. As we were going home, we looked like baboons. Our backs are those you know, marks of, of mud. But from the Lake region to the northeastern, there was a sense of identification with this new leader. He was on a stretcher, barely able to speak or say anything. But there was a sense of acceptance by a people who said, this is our new leader. May God grant us such a, a moment again as a country. Amen. Despite all our political differences, that we can come together and affirm and be able to move together, not always pulling in different directions. Anyway, that was a side issue, side comment. So, a very common passage, only 18 verses, but very important lessons. So let me look, draw, a, as I move towards a close, draw some biblical principles from this leadership transition. From Moses to Joshua, we learn the following principles for effective leadership transition. Just six of them very fast. One is that leadership is chosen and anointed by God. Leadership is chosen and anointed by God. I'll explain that a little bit. Number two, the recognition and development of emerging leaders is a critical principle we see in this story between Moses and Joshua. Number three, mentoring of emerging leaders is very critical in a smooth or for a smooth transition of leadership. Number four, is the call and commitment to be strong and be courageous and obey all the law. Leadership comes with responsibility. But it also comes with an assurance, and we look at that. Number five, leaders must re recognize their limitations, the limitations of their leadership. Moses realized he would leave the scene and began way over 40 years before to prepare somebody to take over from him, and not just one person, several people. And the sixth principle is that sharing of leadership is central to effective leadership transition. Leadership at some point has to be shared. So let me look at those very, very quickly. The number one, leaders, leadership is chosen, excuse me, is chosen and anointed by God. And we see this principle 
through Moses. Moses listened and obeyed God in the choice of Joshua. It was not his pet project. Who is the so and so's project? No. It was God who said, anoint Joshua, son of Nun. Moses recognized that God is ultimately responsible for the choice of the new leader. And Moses, but Moses nevertheless played his role in developing Joshua, but was still remaining keen to listen to God. And time will not allow me to talk about David when, you know, um, Prophet Samuel goes to anoint God, has sent him to, to anoint uh, a new king, and he looks at the, the other brothers from David, and the tall one, the tall handsome one, and he thinks, maybe, maybe, this is the one, but God says, no. For my ways, or my thoughts are not your thoughts. God, man looks on the outside, God explains, but God looks on them, on the inside. And it's very instructive, insightful. By the way, as a, a side comment, as you read through the book of Joshua, is one of the very few leaders that you do not find mistakes with. He makes, he's human, he makes one or two mistakes, but you don't find major issues in his life. He was chosen and anointed by God, and prepared thoroughly. So leadership is chosen and anointed by God. And I trust that the new leaders who are coming in are not coming in in the strength of their oratory skills or their ability to, to mobilize resources or whatever it is, but that God has spoken both to the members who elected them, but most importantly to themselves as new leaders, that they have a sense of God's calling and God's anointing upon their lives as the leaders for this season. It is very important that both the people who are choosing new leaders and the people who are being chosen have that very deep certainty and confidence from God. If you still don't have it, of course leaders are weak and, and keep, keep on questioning. Moses questions God and says, I am a stammer and all that. that. The courage and the face is failed. Was it that he could speak any better? No. But he could only face Pharaoh because he knew he had chosen, he had been chosen and anointed by who? By God. It therefore disturbs me when I see church leadership, and I hope CUs have not got to that point where there's campaign and whatever going on in order to choose to have so and so be chosen as a leader. It is a tragedy, a travesty of biblical teaching. We go through scriptures throughout, and the refraining phrase we see over and over again it seemed good to the Lord, to the Holy Spirit, and to us. Set aside Paul and Barnabas. The Spirit said, after they had prayed and fasted, the Spirit said what? Set apart Paul and Barnabas. Number two, recognition and development of emerging leaders. Moses faithfully developed Joshua and others, Caleb and several other people, for the task ahead. God gave Israel clear instructions on how to develop emerging leaders. If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 to 9 and verse 20 to 25, there are clear expectations of who leaders were to be. They are not just to be chosen from the riffraffs of society, no. And we go back to the New Testament, the book of Titus, the book of Timothy, and several other passages. You go back to the book of Acts of Apostles, when the apostles needed to choose the seven elders, the seven uh, deacons. There was a criterion. Choose men who are full of the Holy Spirit and have wisdom. Some of the leaders we have chosen, I wonder where we got them from, politically. They opened their mouths and the smell is like sewer, sewer which is busted. And the question we ask is, were they even developed as leaders first, before they were chosen? We need to recognize and develop emerging leaders. Those of you who are taking over leadership, they are, are, they first, year, are they first years right now? Yes. They are first years, second years, and others. You need to induct them very consciously, very intentionally into leadership. Some of them will come here and their knees will be fellowshipping with one another. They didn't forget what to say. The first time you stand here with, in, 
all this, whatever, you just feel like all these eyes are going to chill you. But that's part of leadership development. That's part of identifying and recognizing the potential in somebody else and giving them the opportunity. You don't have always to be the one who does A to Z. No, you are not a good leader. If you are the only one we are seeing all the time, there's a big question mark in your leadership. The recognition and development of emerging leaders. Ongoing leadership training and development is very critical. While you're not making a promise to any, you're not promising and saying, oh, you are the next incoming, uh, see you mom, or see you whatever. No, you can't make that promise. That final ultimate choice is whose? It's God's. But you and I, who are in leadership, our responsibility is to identify the potential in some of these people and begin to give them the platform, give them the mic. You are now going for a mission, is it in where? In Tesla? Sorry, Mount Elbow. Yeah? If it is the same, same, same old faces, old voices, who are doing everything, there's a problem. Give some of the new people the opportunity. They mess it up, give them the opportunity to make mistakes. You are also, somebody trusted you in you. I remember the first time when I, I got saved in Homer Bay High School in 1984, and as a Form 1 then, so maybe that gives you a bit of my age, you know. And the first time, very quickly, the CEO leadership gave me the microphone to preach. To sh not to preach, but to share in the CEO fellowship. Just a small group of us, 20 of us. And I prepared like I, would, I was going to die, because I didn't feel how it was going to turn. I was so scared. I'm a very shy person, introverted. I think they know. We travel with knows that I'm very quiet. Especially in the morning. I take time to wake up. <laughs> My wife knows that. And I, I stepped in that, there was no posh pulpit like this, but I stepped in front of my fellow classmates, my fellow students, my fellow brethren, and everything, I said, praise the Lord, praise the Lord again, and everything evaporated. <laughs> everything. When I say everything, everything evaporated. Those were the days I've not been taught that you need to have at least some handwritten, some notes. So I've not written anything. And I drew a complete blank. So I started, started again. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord again. Praise Him again. <laughs> Absolutely not. That experience is still etched in my memory to date. How many years? 84 to date. Over 30 years or so. But the CU chairman who had pushed me in front realized what was going on. And he quickly stepped out and took, we didn't have a microphone, took the stage and shared his heart out. He said, brother, sit down, you've done the beat. That is the first beat. You've passed the first test. Oh. Amen? Amen? You need to give emerging leaders the opportunity. My time is almost up. Number three, mentoring of emerging leaders is critical. Moses personally mentored Joshua into leadership for almost 40 years. If you read that history and plot it well, it was almost 40 years before Joshua took over from Moses. But it was not a distance, it was not a, just a class teaching, a program that he was being taught, come to leadership 101. No. <laughs> Moses shared his life with Joshua. Personal. Personal sharing of our lives is such a powerful way and goes beyond programs. Existing leaders therefore must intentionally mentor the next generation of leaders. Have them to see you at your weakest point. Have them to see you when you are annoyed, when you are not sure what to do. When you stand here, when our chairman stands here, he knows everything. But I'm sure there are moments when you look back and you say, I don't even know what to tell the congregation. But you need to have a younger person working with you, the secretary, whoever, and mentor them. Let them see your life, see you, and that will call for vulnerability. Number four, the call and commitment to be strong and courageous and to obey all the law. God's call to Joshua remains true to date. 
be strong and courageous and obey all the Lord. That is God's promise to us. Be strong and courageous. I will be with you and obey all the Lord. Leadership is tough and stretching, hence the call or commitment to be strong and not be afraid is very true. A leader's allegiance is ultimately to God and hence the commitment to follow God. Walk, or the leaders need to walk with the Lord in obedience is foundational to their success. Our spirituality, our walk with the Lord, the time we spend in the Bible, the time we spend praying, the time we spend waiting on God, asking God which way should we go. The moment, like Moses will say, if your presence doesn't go with us, then do what? Do not take us from here. If your presence is not going to be with us in Mount Elgon, then let us not leave this house. Number five, leaders must recognize their limitations, the limitations of the, their leadership. Moses knew he was soon exiting and prepared Joshua to take over. Every leader will eventually exist, even so some or whoever it is, the, the ones I was mentioning, they will eventually exist. And you find when the leadership has stayed of a state like that, what is the problem? When they leave, there's total confusion. Because they have not recognized the limitations of their leadership. The fact that you will exist, even if you are the most, the darling of all the people, at time comes, you have to exist. And so you need to recognize that. Even the greatest of leaders will still leave and finish business. And you have them to recognize those things. Leadership therefore demands the humility and vulnerability to acknowledge our limitations. And to be able to say like David to Solomon, David wanted to build the temple. Read the story. And he approached God and God told him, your hands are not clean. You have killed too many. It is your son Solomon who will build the temple for me. For David, the temple was unfinished business. But the Bible tells us that David went ahead and continued to gather resources in preparation for the building of the temple. And no wonder when the temple is dedicated, my, you read that passage, when God's glory fills the temple, it is real, it is deep, it is intense. Because a leader, David, had recognized his limitations, but did not, was not insecure in his limitations, went ahead to prepare and make preparations for the successor, to even succeed over and above the leader. Somebody said, and allow me just a few minutes to conclude this, somebody said that the, the, the success or the height of your leadership is not measured by how the height you reach when you, while you are in leadership. It is actually a measure of the height that the next leaders will reach after you. Let me repeat that. The height of the success of my leadership is not when I'm at my top. No. Because most likely I'm at that top because whoever somebody else lifted me on their shoulders. It is therefore critical that as we transition in leadership, we are able to identify limitations and lift others to finish the unfinished businesses that we do not finish as leaders. The leaders' weaknesses, limitations, keep them dependent on God's strength alone. And lastly, sharing of leadership is central to effective leadership transition. God commanded Moses to share some of his leadership, some of his authority in the passage we read earlier on. Share it with Joshua. He was still a leader. God says, <laughs> I don't know what Moses felt. If Moses was a typical Kenyan, a Kenyan politician. And God is telling you, share some of your authority with your junior. Maybe he's going to enable the people to begin trusting and obeying Joshua as their incoming leader. Existing leaders must learn to share their leadership or authority to pave way for smooth transition. Some quick one minute as I conclude practical implications. What does that, this mean for us today? I cannot overemphasize, number one, that we need to focus on God for his guidance on leadership, leadership succession. Prayer and fasting, listening to God for who the leaders will be, not Modo Wanyumba, not our person from, our, from wherever. As we choose whether be they 
political or whatever leaders, may God help us to listen to him. And more so in next year's election, I beseech you, I beseech myself, may God help us to listen to him in, and seek his guidance for, or rather in leadership succession. Two, the second implication. May God help you and I to recognize and develop emerging leaders. Constantly have a pool of leaders being developed. Constantly. Any institution that does not develop their leaders will eventually die. Any institution that does not constantly develop new leaders, a pool of leaders, any institution that keeps on frantically looking when time comes for transition, they are frantically looking for other people who have been developed elsewhere, I can tell you that institution will not survive the test of time. Whether it is the Christian Union or the country or whatever, may God help us to continually, constantly have a pool of leaders who are being developed. Politics, for example. Some of us want to be politicians when we exit from here, isn't it? But have you been a, a political leader, a student leader here on campus? And what kind of a leader, a student leader, have you been? That's a part of development that you must go through. Anyway, time may not allow me to um, apply that. Commit to personally mentor emerging leaders. Let us commit to personally mentor emerging leaders. Always ensure you have somebody who is others that you spend time with. Can we find three generations in your pool of friends? At least three generations. If not, then there's a problem. There's a serious problem as far as leadership is concerned. So commit to mentor emerging leaders. Commit to be strong and courageous and to obey God's law. Pay close attention to your, the leader's spirituality and ethics, morality, so that it is not just...